everybody in internet land uh, and YouTube and whatnot. I'm Jeff Straw again here at Pure Mind with another episode of Producing Out Loud. This time joined by my good friend Chris Gear, you know and go. love. And here on the uh, the call, we've got um, Aruna. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. We're going to let you guys introduce yourselves <laughs> so that I don't botch your uh, your backgrounds. And uh, my good buddy Ming, a.k.a. Aaron Albano from New York. So, uh, Aruna, give, give everybody a quick the quick rundown of who you are and why you're here and, and then we'll, we'll let Ming do the same. Um, I'll work backwards. I'm here because uh, I was uh, invited to do this by uh, the good folks over there at Pure Mind because I am, uh, as of now, um, part of their mentorship program and uh, get to uh, have the opportunity to work with anyone who wants to work with me anywhere in the world uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and I'm really excited about doing this. This is something I've been wanting to do for actually a really long time. Um, it, it, the idea started um, particularly as something I wanted to do with girls because, um, as I'm sure we'll get into later in this podcast, it really um, disturbs me how few women there are in our scene, particularly as art, uh, artists, producers. Obviously, there's a ton of singers, but um, so... Um, Obviously, I'd love to work with anybody, but I, I especially want to work with really talented girls and, and um, enhance whatever they have in them and help them, you know, become their best version of themselves and bring that female voice into the, the conversation musically. Um, and as, as far as me and who I am, I started in dance music 10 years ago, for anyone who doesn't know me, um, as a singer in trance. And um, through the course of this journey, um, I started DJing in 2011. And um, I have had have a degree in music production and film scoring from Berkeley College of Music, but I really got into songwriting and singing when I graduated. And then it was only after I started DJing and making mashups and decided that I wanted to contribute more to my own solo releases once I started doing them that I sort of circled back around to producing again. And this was around 2013, 14, 15. Um, 2015 is when it really kind of officially started. And, and now basically um, at the end of the day, I have decided to uh, leave trance and I've been doing bass music, um, mostly drum and bass. I have one future bass track that I'm working on, but um, drum and bass seems to be working out well, liquid drum and bass. And um, singing a, a little bit, sometimes I sing on my track, sometimes I don't, but I'm really focused right now on, on producing and you know, refining my skills in that area. It's very exciting. Awesome. Yeah. Speaking great. of drum and bass. <laughs> That's sort of where you got your start, right, Ming? I mean, yeah, I guess um, you're, you're, I guess I'll, I'll just go all the way back. I was uh, I was half of Ming and FS. I'm still Ming, um, so that goes back to about 1997. Um, uh, Jeff and I actually bought our first pair of turntables together. That's how far we go back. We bought them from DJ Strike, so I always like to throw his name out there when we can. He's still doing his thing. So I had a three album deal with Ohm Records, um, and then I did a fourth album with Ming and FS on Spun Records. And in 2006, after touring about 150 dates a year for 10 years, I kind of retired from the music business. And I got back into it around 2008, um, writing and producing songs for other artists. And um, I, we were the first American signings to Cobalt Publishing. So we kind of, I was going back and forth between New York, LA, and, um, and London doing, doing writing with other artists. And in around 2009, when dance music became pop music, I have been really into the electro, electro house scene. Um, I started out as a hip hop and drum and bass producer. Um, that's what I was primarily known for, but dubstep had gotten really big. <clears throat> Everybody expected me to go into dub, dubstep and do the angry genres. But personally, I just wasn't there anymore. I was, um, I'm a pretty happy guy and I love, I've always loved house music and I loved house music performing in FS. And so I was really focused on doing you know, electro house and those kind of genres. Um, and I reconnected with the manager who manages Cascade, Stephanie LaFerro, or managed Cascade, and she we said, let's do this again. So I got back out as an artist and started producing tons of records for myself and for other people. I write and produce music for many DJs and artists, um, which we don't talk about. But in the pop world, that's pretty standard. I do a lot of pop, pop production and um, rock production, and those types of things are pretty standard to be part of a team that help 
produce music. So that kind of brings me up to up, up to today. I'm still releasing pretty heavily. I've got a bunch of releases coming out on Sony. I just did a remix contest with you guys, with uh, Indaba, which went really well. We had an excellent, um, really excellent submissions, and we were really happy with the turnout. You know, um, and I'm also doing some mentoring. So I am a, I am available as a uh, as a mentor and as a teacher for for. Um, different classes. You can sign up, but I will never teach them. You will never actually get me. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I'm 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 also teaching production and all kinds of different things for, for you guys. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. Shout out to oh, and I got and I got Newman. a Grammy nomination for a drum and bass track, which is probably not many people have ever gotten. So I just yes. mentioned that because you said drum and bass, so I was like, all right, yeah. Uh, in the 2015, I got a a, a a Grammy nomination for a drum and bass remix of uh, Cross Fingers. Um, what was the name of the track? Forgetting now. Maybe we'll just we'll splice that in later. Um, yeah. Title yeah. card it. So that's what's up. Yeah. Shout out to shout out to Newman Paul who won your remix contest through us with Indaba. Um, that track was so uh, New- solid. Yeah. Right. Really, we were all kind the of thrilled with it. The top totally um, solid. Totally. Yeah. Um, um, it, we, we had over 200 submissions, which is just a cool thing. And like, we're going to talk about vocal production today. And I think that remixing for me is such a big part. Um, you know, I've had more experience working with remix vocals than probably either one of you guys have, uh, as far as original stuff and recording, but, um, let's hop right in. Yeah. You want to toss, toss the first line out here? Why not? <laughs> so, um, we want to start on the production side of things and kind of move through in a linear path uh, to the the post-release um, process with working with vocalists in general, specifically with electronic music. Um, but how are you guys finding the folks that you're collaborating with? What is the selection process for you guys? Should I to go first? Or? Yeah, yeah, Ming, why don't you? I, I, um, so, so my process is a little bit selfish, and I think with the way that today's music producers, how it's so easy to get into the music production game. For me to be successful as a writer producer, I tend to to do this path with somebody. If I'm looking for something for my music, their voice has to fit what I'm doing. And so I'll either um, search for voices or search for collaborators who co-write that can, that can, we can be successful. I don't like to do sessions with people and not be successful. So if you're a singer songwriter, I may approach you, you may need production and you may want me to write with you, but I'd rather you write with me first for my song because I'll know I'm in the room. So I know that if I hear what I like, it's going to get cut on a record and then you can be happy about working with me. I think 99% of getting good vocals is having a good relationship with the singer and making them feel comfortable and finding the best parts about their voice and writing songs that help um, bring out those best elements and hiding, you know, everyone has imperfections. We gotta hide the imperfections. So my process is basically gets, I'm selfish. I find somebody that I can put on one of my songs. And then if that relationship works and we don't hate each other in the studio, then the next song we can write for other people or we can write for them or I can continue to write for myself. And I do a lot of writing for other artists. so. If, if I know, let's say, X person needs top lines for their tracks, I'll say, well, would you like to write on this person? Your voice fits this person. They love the thing that I did with you. Would you want to try to write a song for them? Um, and that's become very common in the electronic music world because we have a lot of great electronic producers, but they're not necessarily songwriters and vocal producers. And I think that that's a little bit something that you get into as a mat- more of a mature producer, you know, getting into that, or writer also. Sure. That, did, I, did I answer your question? I just talk in circles. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Aruna? How how do you go about your collaboration like selection process? Um, well, originally coming into the scene as a vocalist, um, my process is kind of backwards from what Ming just described, because um, you know I came in as a singer, so um, it was as a featured vocalist and. Uh, so it was, you know, guys coming to me asking me to do stuff for them. And uh, obviously, as a featured vocalist, it behooves you to work with the biggest and most high profile artists you can. So you're sort of, you know, when you're first starting out, you're kind of working your way up that uh, up that ladder. And, you know, it took me I started in 20, 2007 and then. You know, it wasn't long before I started getting to work with um, people like Marcus Schultz and Ferry Corson. And then in 2013, I got to work with Armin, which was really cool. Uh, Armin Van Buren. And, um, you know, once you start working on that level, it's it's very easy. But 
so for me, that was never... What, the- what, before you move on, what about it makes that easy? Because some people would think like, oh my God, I'm with this like superstar producer. This is like so much pressure. Oh, and no, you no. said it's actually no, easier. No, 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 I, I It's easier to get more work. Exactly. That's what I meant. Uh, haha, yes. Because you're then on Fairy's record or Armin's record. So everybody wants you next. Exactly. Right. right? Okay. That, right. that makes a lot of sense. That's what I meant. Um, okay. What's... What's more of a challenge is then when you want to go solo, it's sort of like what Ming was saying. It's like, you know, these guys, they just want to build their own careers. So, you know, when I started going solo, I did find it quite challenging um, in the beginning to find people to produce the tracks for me. And this was one of the things that started um, making me think I wanted to start producing for myself is I, I you know, I really don't like the idea of my career hinging <laughs> on someone else who is more concerned about theirs. You know what I mean? Sure. So yeah, that's exactly what I was saying to you, which is I'm not trying to be selfish. I'm trying to make the relationship successful. But I hear exactly what you're talking about, because I find that the same thing happens with singers. They don't really want to. They want to make sure that they get taken care of before you get taken care of. Really? really? Yeah, I find it all the time. I think it depends if it's if it's somebody who wants to be like an artist. I mean, at the time, I was you know happy to do the the featured vocalist thing because there was you know there was touring there, um, and then you know I, I developed a great relationship with Mayan and Shane Fifty Four, and and the three of us toured all over the place, um, and you know as we all know that's where all the money is these days. So, <laughs> so um, I was fine. It's a growing weed. It's not in music. You- <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, within the realm of music, I should say. Maybe. <laughs> that is kind of in the... Anyways. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> so so how about the actual collaboration process? How much of what you're doing is actually in person, in the same space as the people that you're working with? Like, and how much nowadays is actually just remote? Like 98% of it is remote. It's, I, like, it's all yeah. remote? It's all remote. And so, yeah. so for me, it, it's the other way which is i'm i'm really like i like to i'm a good vocal producer and i'm like that because i like to be in the room with the person and be, have that relationship with that person and get in and hear them in the room and then once i do that let's say a couple of sessions with a good singer or artist then i can do it remotely i find it really and I do a tons of Skype writing with people. Like if I have a great week with you or we do write a couple of songs together, then after that you could be wherever you are and I can get on Skype or Google Hang with you and I can write a great song with you and not feel like this weird sort of, um, you know, I might be a little old school. It's sort of like, you know, it's in the sense of just, I like to be in the room with people. I like, I like that contact. I like to feel that we have something more than just this sort of like email relationship. But well, that, I mean, what you started off by saying was that 90% of it is, is getting that relationship and making them feel safe and comfortable, right? And so if you're not there, it's, it's almost impossible to do that. Yeah, and also for me to write lyrics and, and to do things with an artist, I mean, I sing as well, but I'm not a featured vocalist. I am not a lead singer. That's not me. I'm the background singer. I can sing you melodies. I can give you great ideas. I would say a lot of the songs that you hear me writing, I'm writing a lot of the, vo- the, the lyrics and the top line with the person. I'm not just like, here's a track. Do you know? Do your top line, which which I can, which I do as well. That's a little bit more of like, hey Aruna, here's a track. Are you feeling it? Can you cut some ideas? Let me pick the best ideas, or you know, let's write a song about bananas. I don't know. You know, I just it, 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 everyone it, loves bananas. Also, the other thing that I try to do, which may be different than um, maybe why I'm successful at getting what I'd like, is that I like to work with artists. I like there to be something about the artist that supersedes who I am as a, as a producer. I can write everything for you. I can make it sound amazing and I can just hire you to sing a song. But I really want you to give me something back that's that I didn't want to come up that I didn't come up with. It could be two little lines, it could be lyrics, it could be change in the melody. I just want to have that experience cuz for me it's not just Xs and Os. It's like I want to have a moment where it's just not all coming from me. Especially with the amount of music I'm doing, I want somebody to be able to like tickle me so that I think about them again. You know, like, I want to work with that person again because they tickled me. Like, that was interesting. Why did she come up with or he come up with that lyric? Like, you know, that way I'm always learning because otherwise it's just you just repeat yourself for me. Sure. You know, sure. Um, for, for me, it's it's less about the relationship and more about the track. It's like 
if the track inspires me, I don't really, I don't have to know the person at all. It's like I almost know them through the song. Like, oh my God, there's so much love and heart in this. I'm, I'm on it. Like, just ideas are coming. So, but that's, you know, because if for, as a featured vocalist, if that's what you want to do, if you're, if you only want to work with people in person, you're really, really limiting yourself geographically. Yeah. Well, unless you're in LA or New York, right? <laughs> I mean, then there's like kind of no, Even not then, much of a shortage. I mean, most of the people I worked with are not here. So hmm. yeah. there you go. See, this is why I love music as an art form because people can be on opposite sides of the spectrum working on the same type of material and whatnot, have totally different perspectives, mm -hmm. totally different approaches. If I was Aruna, um, I'd do exactly what she's saying. I mean, I, the reason our perspectives mm -hmm. are different is just that she's coming from a vocalist first background into production. Right. And I'm coming right. from a songwriter into production into right. So I'm completing a project in my mind that I'm I'm thinking of ahead of time and I'm writing songs with a goal in mind. As a vocalist, you're being presented with somebody's idea. And the more that idea is flushed out, the easier it is for you to come up with something really exciting because you get excited by the music and you know if you do something great, the music already sounds great. Right. But for me, I like to be able to say, you know, what I'm going to create is going to be better than what, what we come up with now. Like whatever we come up with now with these chords, this idea on the piano, this guitar or this skeleton beat, if I get a great vocal from you, if we do this together, I'm going to be excited to then outdo the production with the, with to match your vocal and to hide any imperfections and to enhance the things that really make me. So it's just the same. I think it's the same thing. It's just two directional. You know, it's 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 how you get your projects done. Aruna, when you were working with like kind of some of those heavyweight guys you, you mentioned earlier, how much of that was here is your lyrics, here is your melody, please crush this performance versus hey, here's a loose idea. And, and, and was it different with, with each project or did you see a lot of similarities? I, I, do, I won't work that way. So, sorry, say again? I said I won't work that way. Okay. I, I, I'm a writer first. So um, in my entire career, I did one cover song. It was Ashley with uh, Philo and Perry. That was, and it wasn't like they wrote it. It was some, it was like a singer songwriter girl and they wanted to make a dance track out of it. And it was kind of an obscure song. So, you know, it was kind of cool to do that. Um, but, it, you know, that one was hard because I didn't write it. And to be honest, I had no idea what the song was about. Mm. <laughs> so, just no connection, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah so it's, it's hard to sell something. And, you know, for me, I'm, I think what people like about me as a singer is that I sing, I really sing from my heart, from my viscera. And um, I'm somebody like uh, most people um has been through a lot of pain and i use music to um sort of sing my way through all that and and get that out and i'm very raw and honest about that and that comes through in my lyrics that's why i won't let anybody write lyrics for me because you know who else can tell my story but me who else can sell a song I, you know it's like i have to have lived it you know yeah and um it, it just makes the performance so much better. Like the song I just wrote, um, well, two songs I just wrote. Um, one was about the death of my cat and uh, who was my cat for 17 years, who was like my husband. And um, the other was about a lot of um, frustration and angst I've been feeling lately um, ever since I made the switch into producing um, things, not just a lot of resistance I've been feeling and um, kind of doubt from some people and um, just a lot of obstacles and it's been very frustrating. And um, so I poured that into a song and it's the passion in this performance. I just finished it and recorded it a couple days ago. There was moments I was listening. I had chills. It was like, this is just this, rah, it was like this warrior girl, like just is intense, you know? And um, so, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very uh, adamant about this. I need to tell my story and I need to be the one to, to write that story and perform it. So even though you were a, a you know featured vocalist, you're very much an artist and always have been an artist, which is what you were saying, Ming, is that th those are the kind of people you like to wor work and collaborate with. So yeah, because I mean, she just basically described the passion that she has. And so like now sitting here as a producer and a writer, I'm thinking to myself, well, this is somebody I'm working with. I'm, she's going to be passionate about the content that she's bringing. And, you know, it makes my job 
I would say easier because unless we don't, unless we disagree about what the top line ends up being, but it, you know, at least, you know, going in where that type of person is, it's look, it's right. kind of like dating. And I'm going to just make break it down. Now that we know she likes her boyfriends to poop in a box. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Cause you said the cat thing. No, you, you can cut that out. Um, <laughs> you, don't have to cut that out. That was actually really it's, funny. It's, you know what I'm saying? But basically like it's you, you're sitting down with a, a blank slate. You don't know the person. You need to right, you yeah. sit down and you and you have sort of this first date, so to speak. It's a little uncomfortable. You're like a singer is very exposed. You're not yeah. like a producer is less exposed. Like I can sing you my bad melodies and I can play you whatever and I you can hate on all of my tracks, but ultimately, it doesn't really affect me. But if you're on the microphone and you're singing to me and I don't like what you're doing or you're not comfortable with who I am or you're not comfortable with like the surroundings, you're gonna sound bad. You're gonna yeah, your voice gonna is fizzle. gonna tense up. You know, like I'm I'm really like cognizant of that stuff if somebody's flying in you know if they're coming in from let's say if i'm doing an album and somebody's coming in from australia and i know they're going to be exhausted and they're insisting on working within 48 hours of getting to new york i'm like it, we're, as long as we're not cutting vocals because you're going to be right. terrible you're going to be exhausted right. your voice is going to sound you've been on a plane for right. 12 hours or 14 hours or whatever you know or that's part of the process. It's like figuring out who, are, people are just people. Are there, any, thing, music, are there any other like real, real like static things that you kind of always have on hand, you know, the hot tea stuff and like, what do, what do you do to vibe, make that vibe as a general rule? Are there like a rule of thumb that you kind of yeah, roll I, with? I hang out with the artists or get to know them first. Right. Generally I like, we'll go to lunch. My, like uh, when I try to do writing sessions with somebody, I basically say, if we can hang out, go to lunch and listen to music together for like two or three hours, by the end of the day, we're going to write something great. Yeah. Then I can understand. Yeah. As I was say, what you're describing reminds me of like um, when I do co-write sessions, like not for my own stuff, but for like signed artists. Um, like I went to Nashville for a week last year and we went to all these different writing sessions with these Nashville writers. And it was kind of almost, we didn't necessarily go to lunch, but there was a period of like sitting, talking, kind of getting to know you. And absolutely yeah. that helps. It's yeah. important. Yeah. I mean, it, look, made. you can, you don't have to like everything about somebody, but music is about in, human interaction. We're not making music for birds or for monkeys. Like, we're making <laughs> music. That's right. No, I mean, like, if you don't care, you can be an artist that absolutely does not care what anybody thinks about what you do, as long as you make music in your surrounding. And then that means you're a pyramid on the way down. You're the, per, you're the center, you have musicians on below you, and you're just, F you, this is my job, and this is what I'm doing. Or... You can be a person who likes to involve other people in that process. It's there's many, you know, it's not that cut and dry, but I think it's hard to involve invite people into your circle if you're not willing to give them something. Well, well and music is very yeah, transparent too. So if I feel like if if there's some weird dynamic going on, it's gonna come through. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty emotional process. I mean, it's not that emotional for me anymore, to be honest with you. But I do like my singers to, to have an emotional connection. Like that's 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 something that's absolutely right. I'm trying not to bring my emotions to my sessions. I'm trying to be welcoming. Right. Yeah. I think that's an well, it's like the one. It's it's like the one part of this whole art form that isn't necessarily totally in, open to interpretation. You know, because when you're dealing with just the music, the listener can be applying whatever like experiences or thoughts or whatever to whatever is coming through the music. But when there are actual lyrics there, you're, you're adding a certain amount of specificity to the equation. Exactly. And if, and if someone's written a song, um, you need that vocalist to just ooze whatever the intention was or, or to provide some sort of connection for the listener to the original intent of the music. I think that's supremely important. I mean, I think that's why some people hate on pop music per se pop music in the blanket term of pop music is that that music is often written with the intention of meeting as many minds as possible and making you enjoy the music for a certain visceral level. It's not always for the depth of the lyric. It's not always for the depth of the melody. So it's easy as it, for a young musician to hate on that concept of like, there's no emotional connection because it's a very broad brush that's tickling <laughs> a lot of different people's things. But even in pop music, there are songs that have had very intense penetration, are very emotional. Um, and, you know, like someone like Pink is writing songs from her heart, whether you like them or not, that's who she is, you know, 
Christina Aguilera used to do that with certain songs, mm -hmm. even though people would be writing songs with her or for her. Those kind of things, there's still a connection. And I think in electronic music, people sometimes lose a sight of that everything that you do in music is sort of a path down the road and something that may right. start out being poppy on one side or underground on another side, they kind of have this meandering life to them. Sure. Well, and you know, you said that earlier, bro, was that, you know, with EDM being pop now and that sort of crossover that's happened, um, you know, there's nothing that says anything that you're creating in the studio won't wind up on the radio or on Sirius XM or whatever. In fact, that's, that's kind of the hope, right? Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of marketing the music and let's talk a little bit about, about rights and ownership. Um, yeah. and I'm sure you guys have two kind of differing, um, viewpoints on this too. So that's, sh that should be good. Um, in terms of writer credits, publishing and, and overall rights, wh what's your general take on it? Uh, Aaron? Um, well, I'm pretty straight up about this depending on, it's all about position and the position is, is very simple. You have to know what position you are coming into in a song. And you need to, my, the general rule is if you're in a room with somebody and you write a song, it's 50-50. Unless that instrumental exists and you have a conversation saying, I've written this instrumental and I'm now I'm going to write lyrics and a melody with you and we're going to split the top line. I will tell you that in all of, I've done over a thousand songs, I rarely, Rarely would I ever say that to a, a, a top line writer. And the reason being is that I want them to be invested. Why yeah. cut somebody out of the race before they even get going? Like, I don't, I, I just think if you're a songwriter that's going to depend on one song to get your career going, I probably don't want to work with you. I want to do multiple songs with you over time. We can write for you, we can write for me. And then on the publishing side, that gets can be a little bit more gray and only only because people have publishing deals and don't have publishing deals. So, for example, let's say Jeff and I, we write a song together and we, whatever, some days I might write 90% of the song and some days you might write 90% of the song, but we just agree, we're in a band and we say, everything's 50-50, that's what Ming and FS did. Ming and FS, we split everything 50-50, there was no questions asked, I could be in the room, I could not be in the room, same thing with him. That way we're never pissing over nickels that don't, don't exist. Yeah. It's not worth like yeah. thinking the one song that you wrote is the song. Um, on the publishing side, that's where labels often want to get a piece of the publishing so you have to be able to negotiate and do some little dealing with the publishing so say again jeff and i have i let's say we own separate publishing companies 50 percent goes to him and 50 percent goes to me we may have to then give a label 30 percent of the publishing even though they had nothing to do with it just to because that's very common to do the deal because then the label has skin in the game Right. So on the back end, on the back which, end, which right. otherwise so they don't that's have. Where, that's where I think more deals are made or is, uh, is on the publishing. I'm actually doing a deal right now where we're going to give the labels 30 percent of the song you know, just because it's good faith. And that way they have skin in the game and that way they're more willing to put marketing money into it because they know if they have a winner, then they're going to make some of that marketing money back. Right. Owning 100 percent of something is not good if it's not going to make money. So, you know, you got to you got to, you know, share and be fair the other thing is, is i've done many writing sessions that were set up say by a third party where i'm in the room and the singers in the room was also an artist and there's another writer in the room and oftentimes those sessions don't really go 33 33 33 that they're not written equally but everybody gets the same writing in the room so like i'll end up writing with the singer and the other guy or girl will just add like a little maybe they'll just agree that happens quite often. Oh yeah, I like that. You're like, okay, great. Here's your 33%. <laughs> so I tend to earn your 33%. I there, tend bro. to do less of those sessions because I don't really. That's where I get a little greedy, which is like, I'd rather if we're gonna write most of the song, you and I could probably do it together. You know, if so, that's that's how I look at it, and I, and I most of the, my things are. And, and so, just one more level, which is if I send a track to somebody, whatever they come back with, unless I'm, unless we discuss it, is gonna be 50-50 again. So when you said position, I thought you were going to go a different direction. Do, do you, does the sort of stature of the co-writer or the artist come into play? Like if, yeah, if you're working with a right. superstar, are you obligated to take less to of a cut or no? To some degree. I mean, like I'll, I can give you an example of how, yes, position matters. Like, you know, if Tiesto says to you and you're an unknown singer, hey, I'd like you to write this song with me. And by the way, you're getting no publishing and um, whatever. That's a, that's a business decision that you're going to make. You're trading your writers or publishing for position on right. someone's record. And that I'm sure 
Arun, you've done this. We've all we've all done this in one way or another in order to get in a better position for ourselves. Mm-hmm. This always happens. The music business is like a. I would never give up my publishing ever. Well. Okay, so <laughs> there, there, there you have it. But I'm I've, I've for me, I've gotten on very good records by doing like negotiating publishing parts on that on that stuff. I mean, right. and the deals wouldn't have happened if they didn't get a piece of the publishing. And so. then it's different on a remix. Like you remix like Black Eyed Peas and some of these like super major labels well, in no their publishing. heyday. There's no publishing artists, remix. and so remixing, you're you're automatically walking into it knowing you're not getting. Yeah, unless a band is nobody, and then they're again, that's a position where a band is not in a good position, and their song might not be good enough, and they, you're going in to fix a song, and then you fix a song, and they call that like like the Ming edit or whatever, and then maybe they're offering p- publishing on that because that's how they're going to pay you. Right. Um, the that's Ming a, radio edit. Say again? <laughs> the Ming radio edit. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying like sometimes yeah. that's another way of bringing in another producer sure. and, and monetizing and helping you pay the producer without having to actually pay them something. Everyone's got skin in the game. That's what I mean yeah. by position because position isn't necessarily about like I'm a superstar, you're not, I'm going to screw you, that's the end of the story. It's more about how can I position myself to make the song have more legs? Right. So there are other things that you can do with publishing and writing. Say I write a song with another artist and and we write a song together and I'm producing it. And halfway through the production, I'm like, I get I'm starting to work with somebody new and they have a large fan base. And I'm like, you know what? The music that I'm doing is very similar to what they're doing. Hey, bro, what do you think of this track? Do you want to jump on this track? Then all of a sudden there's three. And then I'll say I can give you I'll give you a third of the writers and I'll give you I'll cut you in on the publishing and we both we all know what that means what that means is we're trying to go from just two sure two marketable entities to three marketable entities and that is one of which might be like a leg up right i mean if you see with a good litmus for if you see a big artist with a name you've never heard of generally and this is not always true but generally (laughs) the, the guy that you've never heard of is the one that wrote the track Right, or right, right. And the guy, the bigger guy, is the guy who's making that track visible right, to the right, world. Of course. And there's a yeah. there's a symbiotic relationship in that because you would never know that this guy's track existed if this guy wasn't on. That's right. Or or woman or girl, you know, like that happens a lot. You know. Yeah. You would never know who's the girl. I'm forgetting now that Skrillex brought up. You would never. Misha is that, mm-hmm. is that? You would never know of her if he didn't put his hand over her head. And you would never know some of the artists underneath her if she didn't put her hand over their head. Right. It's basically it's like, super typical. Yeah. Yeah, it's sure. very typical of the music business, which is sort of the pyramid thing where you're you're trying. Especially to- in EDM, though, I feel like like rock music, you don't you don't see this sort of thing. Maybe a feature vocalist here and there, but like within EDM space, you see it all the time. Well, hip hop is yeah. very, that's hip hop is the blueprint. Hip hop is totally like that. Yeah. Like, you, know, you had yeah. what you started. You had uh, Dr. Dre signed Eminem. Eminem signed. Uh, right, 50. 50, right. 50 signed, had the group and signed, you know, on and on and on. And so that pyramid always leads back up there. In rock, it happens a different way. In rock... Well, rock is have, so much more established. It has roots. But it's different and, in the sense of, like, there's not rock bands who are running street-level productions. Right. Like, hip-hop is a street that, you know, comes from... That's right. Like, where stores are involved. You know, there's, like, a, there's a pe- pecking order. In rock, you'll see that for touring. So you'll have a band, let's right. say signed yeah. to a major and then the band bo- before them is buying onto the tour they're actually mm-hmm. paying to be on the tour because mm-hmm. that helps offset offset the, the touring bands the, the the headlining acts costs and then the the opening act gets exposure you know you get to open right. up you too so, so to speak yeah. and if you do really well on that tour then all of a sudden you're going to be playing stadiums too and it's right. worth the investment that's like a label as a bank that's kind of where labels come in it's a whole different conversation but so there's that's so, what so, I mean by position. Position is yeah, really no, no, relative. that's dude, that's that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's good and, perspective. And I and I love the perspective. So so Aruna, you said you'd never give up your publishing. So, um, back to the sort of rights, uh, just to get your your take on this. So so whenever you're doing a collaborative writing session or just a vocalist um, on someone else's track, are you always trying to gun for fifty fifty? Do you have some wiggle room? And sort of what's your experience around that? Um. Like Ming said, the general rule is is fifty fifty, and you're if you're in the same room. Um, when I first started, um, as far as publishing, I was offered it was pretty much fifty fifty. Um, the artist splits as a featured vocalist. The producer is always going to try to push you down. 
Um, and in the beginning, you know, if you're trying to make a name for yourself, you know, you suck it up and take it. But, you know, the, the further on you go um, at a certain point, you know, I put my foot down and said, no, um, not doing this 50 50 across the board. Um, I wouldn't do it for anything less than 50 um, publishing or uh, artist split. Yeah. So so making the transition to being more producer centric in your mindset and your career path and everything, how much of it is being spurred by wanting to gain more control over the creative process and having your own material to work with and putting your own voice to it and your own music to it and how much of it is giving more control to your own future and fate in the industry wow um a hundred a (laughs) hundred is it yeah it's pretty evenly split yeah it's um it's definitely driven by both it was driven by um I think it was initially driven by because I was releasing tracks as Aruna and I was getting producers to produce them. And like I'm thinking of a track I did called The End um, where the producer came back with some great ideas. um, But the drop there was like it started great and then it went into some really funky chord territory. And I'm like, why is he going there? And so I was like, um, I started like literally cutting and pasting and moving his chords around in the drop. And then in the verse, I was like, "Mm, I'm not sure what this verse, it's just too pretty. Like I'm singing about, you know, blood in the wind, dust in the sky, the daylight's burning. It's such an apocalyptic kind of lyric. And um, it was just too pretty. And and that's, that was the first time I said, look, I, I, you know, coming from, especially a film scoring background, which is my other major, um, I want to make this really dramatic and dark and just like, Argh. and uh, I said, do you mind if I have a stab at this verse myself? And um, the verse, the final verse for um, the breakdown section for the end, actually pretty much 90% of that is, is me. Um, and that was the first time that I really got in there on my own track. And that was a good entry point because it was a breakdown. So there was no, you know, kick bass all that stuff to deal with it was just um piano part and pads and these kind of these like taiko kind of drums and um these very atmospheric textures and this stuff that always felt more comfortable and familiar to me um so in initially it was like this there was a, a track that wasn't i had a vision for it and they weren't aligning and i wanted to align them and and the more I found myself doing that, the more I was like, this feels right. This feels like like I'm starting to realize here that um, I have something to say as a producer. Um, and there's a lot of great producers out there um, at the risk of sounding cocky. It's not cocky, but none of them are me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's yeah, not that no, I'm that's not cocky. That's better real. than anyone. It's just that I have a different perspective and I'm not hearing this perspective really being expressed out there in the world. And I feel like it, it, it needs to be. And, um, and, and then also, like I said earlier, I, I don't like relying on, I'm always been kind of a hands-on person and I don't like relying on other people, especially for something as important as your own, you know, career, your own success, your own survival, really. Um, so I wanted to have as much, you know, my first manager always said, control what's controllable. And so, um, you know, part of that is making as much controllable as you can. Of course, you still need team, you know, you, you want to work with a good team. You, if you start trying to do everything, it's just too much, but artistically, um, the more I started producing and a lot of this was building confidence too. And the more I did it, the more confident I got. And, um, the more I really, I started to get, wow, there's, there's something here that really wants to come out. And it's right now for me, it's almost more important than, than the singing. The, the singing is, is important because the lyric is important that I feel like, um, they, they go hand in hand, you know, like the, the lyric is a story. It's, it's, I feel like, in dance music right now, it's just, it's way too much, um, way too much kind of yang energy and, and not enough yin, not enough gentleness, vulnerability, honesty. Um, and I'm not sure what that's about, but, um, even if it's like not 
cool to to do that i i don't care it's i feel i feel like it it I, that's what i'm here to do is just open my heart and just like let everyone in so that it's not always a party life so right? that they <laughs> so that they can experience their own more sure listeners you know what i mean sure and and yeah. what's interesting is the way dance music has evolved over the years and especially what's going on right now socially um politically I feel like the climate is, is perfect for this. It's like, you know, yeah. things like the Women's March. I feel like people are kind of hungry for something real. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, as this type of music moves into the pop realm, you know, it, it gives you more reason to provide more ways to connect with people and, and to create something deeper than just dance mm -hmm. music, right? Um, because life is bigger than dancing, so. All he needs it. 303. Um, so <laughs> what about what about live performance? So you mentioned that you, you did a bunch of touring with, I, and I didn't catch their name, um, over the years, uh, Aruna, with the, the, the producers that you did a bunch of touring with. Who oh, was that? Mayan and Shane 54. There you go. Thank you. Um, what did that live setup look like from taking your studio vocals to bring them to the stage? How much of it were you doing live? What was the effects chain looking like? Like, talk a little bit about that. Um... I started touring with them in 2009, I think, and I started DJing in 2011. So there were a couple years where when I would go out with them, I was just singing. And um, basically what we do is, you know, we take the tracks, um, we pull the dry lead out. And I know some people like to sing with their lead in, but like down like six or 10 dB. I never tried that because I was always worried, you know, it's so damn hard to hear. People don't realize this. You know, they hear somebody singing live at a club and they're like, oh, it's out of tune. You're standing on top of the damn subs. It's like <laughs> scrambling your brain. It's so loud. It's and um, you know, at least during breakdowns, you can kind of hear what's going on. But even with the, you know, the in-ears and everything, it's still just, it is so hard to, to nail it. And um, so I, I try to never judge people too harshly when I hear them singing in a, in a club. But um, so I was always afraid that if I left the vocal in, you know, if you leave the vocal in and you're off, it's going to sound really bad. And this is one of the challenges with singing electronic music is it's, you know, with a rock music, you have strings and you have all these organic kind of um, elements that they I don't know why, but for some reason if you're a little bit out of tune, it's, it doesn't sound that bad, but if, you know, with electronic instruments that are just like spot on, if you're like even 10 cents off, it's just like, ugh. so, um, like, uh, yeah. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave any of the dry in. So we took the dry out and we left all the wet in. So we were basically doing it like that. We would have some, um, minimal effects live, um, a little bit of reverb, a little delay, but I was, I really more wanted to kind of use the effects that were in the track. Um, yeah. So it was, it was pretty simple and you know, it kind of, it's, it's, unless you're a level, it's kind of good to be lean and mean when you're touring. You know what I mean? If you're the more complicated your setup, um, it can, it can actually cause problems. So, um, if you can keep things simple, it just, it's just because sometimes there's just not a lot of time for sound check. You know, if you're flying in somewhere and it's like you get in at five o'clock, your sound checks at, you know, six or seven or eight. And then the doors open at 10. It's like so um, I've had that happen a lot. So um, it can be useful to keep things simple. When I started DJing, it changed things because then there was some times where I wasn't even singing at all and then it, that actually made things a lot easier um and it opened up where we could go because there's a lot of places that are not really set up for live vocals especially kind of smaller clubs so um it it allowed us to tour together in places that we otherwise would not have been able to and then it was just for me you know and them too we're all on laptop Ableton so yeah are you guys all DJ off off Ableton mm -hmm. Gotcha. So Ming comes from turntable vinyl background, <laughs> right? What, and then on that deep contour that you guys did, which was like the scratch 
pickled well it wasn't scratch pickle scratch junkies and all these turntable list guys yeah. you guys were one of the first ones to hop onto the cdj thing yeah partly because you were playing live guitar and live bass and it kept everything in tune and you yep. wouldn't get the rumble and all the te- I'm, I'm telling the story that you should tell but no, it's no just I cause, mean, because it's an, it's interesting right and we weren't necessarily going to talk about dj performance we're talking about vocals a little bit but but it all it's all performance so, right it's, so back up a little bit i mean i'm fr- I'm, a, I'm a rock musician i came up playing in metal bands and no like I, you know guitar is my I first and we all and I, and I you know bass and and i played in bands and, and what aruna said is true when you play in a live band or a band situation the frequencies that are coming from the instruments the, the cymbals from the drums the way that it, things are engineered inside of a club they they're a little bit more forgiving mm-hmm. than what a dance club is about a dance club is not one directional it's omnidirectional it's coming down from the ceiling it's coming down from all over the place and it's not really great for a live performance the best when she means a level the best a level situation is that your stage you're someone coming to see somebody who's selling enough tickets that the music is one directional it's coming from the stage and that way the the sound engineers can control the environment better so that the 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 wedges on the stage, the singer can hear themselves, their in ears can hear it. When you're in a club, it's like you know how loud it is. So imagine yeah. trying to sing like that. And so that's what that's why it's never um, optimal for a singer in a dance environment when you're not at an A level where people are coming to see you play a one directional show. So I run for, into this playing horn all the time where like you can barely hear even with a monitor over the subs and I'm like trying to get a reflection like the natural reflection off of my sax on the back of a wall or a speaker or something to just hear a little bit better because we play these like you, it's great gig but it's great for the DJs right yeah. and anybody that's doing stuff over the top it can be a nightmare so, yeah, low so frequencies. my foray into touring as a dj started with vinyl and one thing that people you know have this great oh vinyl 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 i want to hit you with a hammer vinyl enthusiast because you don't know what it's like to be on a tour where your records don't show up when they come down the conveyor belt oh my god or every single time that you go through security they go through your records looking for things and they put them out of order every single day or you it's, you know, that person who was up on stage who decided they wanted to have a drink that night hits your needle across the record and destroys the record that you need to do the routine that you're doing with your partner who you're playing on four turntables or you're playing in a non-optimal club environment where, so Ming and FS, we started playing a lot of raves. That's where we, you know, and club stuff, but we eventually ended up on proper stages. And on a proper stage, there'd still be a, um, a base pocket. So you'd have, we'd have to move the turntables back and forth on the stage until we figured out that we were not sitting in the base pocket because otherwise, A, it kills your ears and B, um, your turntables feedback. Yeah, there's too much vibration, right? <laughs> well, they feedback because the bass goes in through the needles, like, right? So that was that was one thing. And then we also played live bass and guitar. So we, we, when we did that stuff, we had to make sure that the records were pitched in key, you know, in 440 tuning. We'd have to play against that. It was very difficult. And then we were, you know, thrust onto this deep concentration tour. We did 30 dates, I think, on that tour with guys who are infinitely better scratch DJs than we hmm. were. And it was basically like a trial by fire. But what we learned in that was simplicity often is the best key. Don't Absolutely. overdo it. The less you do, the better selections you make. That's going <laughs> with scratching doesn't necessarily make the song better. So we right. learned like where guys were doing amazing scratch routines. We were like, yeah, I'm just going to drop a Biggie Smalls tune. And it's going to get a better reaction. Like that's and that's and, you know like <laughs> that that was fair, right? And then. I did another tour with Vin. He's Rock still nasty Apollo. though. Don't don't let him kid you. Like you and Fred were both yeah, really nasty, but, but comparatively to these, like well, look, those guys were right, really sure. focused on that thing, right? And, and that's so all they did. Powered to them, right? But then we toured with Vin Rock Apollo in Shortcut, and those guys really affirmed the choice of selection over over skill. Yeah. And when I saw them combine selection and skill together, it changed my DJ career 100. percent I no longer felt inadequate about my techniques. I was like. It's, and they'd even say to me, like, I'd be like a little bit ashamed after they'd play. And they'd be like, dude, you guys kill it every night. You, you're, there's a reason why you're headlining this, this show is because you're doing the part that people are reacting to more. The scratch stuff, we're dialing it down on this tour because you guys are able to bring selection out front more. Sure. People are dancing to what you're doing. And that, that gave me the, the security to understand, like, kind of what's going on in live. And so then at some point during this touring... <laughs> um, we had run into Z Trip on tour, and he had just, and he was, I think we were at, I want to say, it wasn't Coachella. We, we played the, 
it was like a big festival with Moby playing. I don't know what it was, but we, we we all roll up to the stage and Z Trip is there and Zach is like, I it, it, it's over. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's over. It's like Pioneer made this thing, and it's it's the real thing. And he's, he's, the deal. and he's a real digger. Like, I am not a right. digger. I don't want to go to a record store and, like, search through records. I don't care about finding that rare sample. I'm not into That's not my thing. Like, I make right. music, right? I'm putting into the pool. I'm not looking to take from the pool. Right, right, right. And I respect the diggers, you know, like DJ Shadow and Zutra. Oh. But he was like, no, man, you just go to Sam Ash and go play the thing. Just go. He was just so, like, not – he was excited but bummed. So I, we right. went to Sam Ash or something like that while we were on tour and checked out the original CDJ 1000s. And both Fred and I were like, and you can change the speed, but the pitch doesn't change. Yeah. Right. That, like pitch and wait, but yeah. the needles aren't going to skip. Yeah. And wait, like all of these <laughs> things that were like, you know, like right. we had to work really hard to get four records to work together at the same time, an acapella right. over an instrumental into a drum and bass record into all these things. And so we took those things. We contacted Pioneer. We were sponsored by Rain at the time. We got in touch with Pioneer. We were like, you know, we're down. What's, can we get six of these to go on the road because we want to have <laughs> right. four on stage and we need two as backups in case this was the first this, these weren't like no one was like yeah there's a band that's gonna go on tour with them so we built road cases and we took them on the road and we beat the shit out of them just because touring is is right. rough on rough. a gear yeah. and we broke a lot of them but we we were working with pioneer to like help version the stuff and it allowed us to do new things on stage that we weren't able to do before because we didn't have to worry about is the needle gonna skip right people could come on stage and dance with us I didn't have to worry about somebody like, you know, that, and that was part of like an experience. Like, so pre bass nectar, pre pretty lights and all that stuff, we were doing things that were kind of leading into that direction. So we could come out and play guitar and bass and not have to worry about, are we playing faster tonight? Hmm. Cause we could play faster tonight, like a rock band could, right? right. Let's play this sure. section faster, but it's still in key. So we can play it on guitar or we can slow it down because people aren't vibing, you know? Yeah. So I think that that's that, that part of the performance thing became really, um, it was you know, trial by fire, and we really learned a lot by it's just brute force. People don't get how brutal the road is. The road is not forgiving. It's just, <laughs> it's like um, there was a story that Billy Corgan told. Or I can't remember in my career when, he, when I heard the story, but he was talking about how he always wanted to be a rock star ever since he was a little kid. And I did too. I grew up with the long hair, and I had like the posters on the wall, and I, my idols, and all that. I always wanted to be a rock star. And he said, you know, and then I became a rock star, and it was nothing like I thought it was ever going to be. He's like, yeah, the stuff like I'm famous, yeah, I got, I get money, I get all this free shit, like all that rock star stuff is true. But nobody told me how hard this career is. It's mm. never ending work. No one ever does the work for you. You don't get to just ride in a limousine and like it's not like Pink Floyd where you know. That's true. It's not like that. <laughs> I work. I, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I work nonstop. I've been working yeah. nonstop since I made the switch to just doing music. And it's always, it's like, yeah, the dream is there, but the dream is paved with blood, sweat, and tears and a, lo and a lot of failure. Yeah. Truth. Oh, I can't tell you how much I failed in this, in this career. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I have extremely have successful records and I've done really all the things that I, I thought I ever wanted to do in the music business. I've done them. I've played, I opened, I played at Coachella. I've, I've, you know, I got a Grammy nomination. Like, I didn't even know I wanted a Grammy nomination. You get that? It's like, ah, you know, if I win a Grammy, that would be great. But it's not, I've made <laughs> records with people that, I, that I've always wanted to make records with. I've toured with people that I was like, oh, I can't believe I'm touring with these people. But I'm still working my ass off. Yeah. And they are too. Yeah. We opened up for Sting in Bryant Park. This, it was like a, a Microsoft sponsored event. And we played this event and all of Sting's band members were watching us play. And I was like, why are these guys watching us? Like, this is Sting. That's like the best, you know, it was Dominic Miller on guitar. These are the best of the best players. If you're an instrumentalist, you're like, if you play with Sting, yeah, yeah, you got yeah. it. That's like, yeah. you played with Frank Zappa, you got it, right? Right. So after the show, we play our half an hour. And then like, I'm rapping with the, the musicians and I literally asked them like why were you guys watching this like we're just playing we're just, we're just <laughs> we're DJing it's not like you're you know like you're Dominic Miller like and they're like because you guys are doing what like we've been doing this you know just as long as you've been playing your instruments but you, this is something we don't do and you're actually making music with what you're doing live and we want we're, we're learning we're learning cool. what you can do with this other technology and I was like it never ends 
right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. then this is the best part. So we're all cheesing with these guys backstage and we're loving that we're hanging out with, you know, these musicians and these guys are great. And now we're all buddy buddy and everyone's like really happy to like, you know, you're the backstage scene. And when everyone's like not being a dick, when, the, when right. people aren't putting position on you right. backstage, right, right. I'm big, you're small. When it gets like this and everyone's having a good time and then Sting comes out <laughs> and like, I'm like, oh shit, it's Sting. And then, but it was a Steve Jobs product launch, and Steve and Sting was nervous around Steve Jobs. And I, just, I was like, it is always, it's never ending. Oh, it's like, the it's dynamic, like a god, right? And then he's he's you know nervous around Steve Jobs. We had Jeff, right. you and I had an experience like that with Stevie Wonder. We should tell that story sometime. Uh, yeah, we sure did. Because who doesn't <laughs> get nervous around Stevie Wonder, right? Oh, Jeff and I man. got to meet Stevie Wonder in college. That was a crazy story, but we'll if we don't have time, we could tell that some other time. Good stuff. Good stuff. Truly. Um, so I think we're, you know, this was great, you guys. First of all, thanks for, for spending the time with us today. I think we'll probably have some some closing remarks. Mm, yes, yes. And I'll, I'll impart some wisdom to everyone because of my beard. Yes. Um, wisdom beard. Yes. Um, but in terms of like big picture advice uh, for p- potentially a producer that's looking to get in and start working with vocals who's, who's new, or, or from the vocalist perspective, looking to kind of make their break into this thing. Like, well, what's a big takeaway that you, you could maybe give to them? And Aruna, let's start with you. Cause, cause there's no pressure in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the internet is a great tool, but at the end of the day, it, it's, it's so oversaturated. Um, this is going to sound really cheesy, but I really feel like if, your music is great and it's from your heart. It will find its way to the top. I mean, for me, like, you know, I got my first collaboration from, I was recommended to the thrill seekers by this other guy, um, who I was talking to. It's all about, um, relationships and great music and your mindset. And this is something, this is something that, um, I actually, I think was the first person and the first person to offer this um, at Pyramind as part of the mentoring, um, because I think this is really important um, is the conversations that go on in your head and on a daily basis, shape your Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something that I was never, um, was never addressed at Berkeley. Um, And I don't know that it's commonly addressed in most college curricula but it's so critically important that i feel like it should be addressed in middle school or high school on one thousand percent yeah yeah and and so um so we do therapy now through the mentorship network is that a, a little what bit there's some artist care i touch on the stuff I, in my sound I design love, classes i love that just no, the I'm fact in all that, seriousness i mean i know we're kind of digressing here but i feel it's so supremely important because undertones and intentions and like the meaning of things is so much more important than any of the technical stuff. Well, and it, play, it's going to affect you know, everything. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are or how good you look Absolutely. or who you know. If your conversation in your own head in the background is like, you know, um, I'm not I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough or mm-hmm. um, if this isn't going to work, you know, you're cynical about everything. It's mm-hmm. going to just it's going to. Throttle you. Like dropping yeah. S-bombs, but it's going to shit all over everything that you're trying to do. Sure. Um, so I think it's really important to get that part right first. I mean, it's not first. That's an ongoing thing while everything else is going on. The relationships, you know, um, making your stuff as, as great as you possibly can. But this is something and there's I was involved with an organization called Landmark Education. I did the forum. I did the advanced course. I did um, self-expression leadership programs. I did the whole curriculum. And that's really about Same. getting in there and, and rewiring your, your brain because what happens in life is something really sort of traumatic happens to you as, as a young child and, and you make a story in your head about that, about what that means about you and what that means about life. And so what, what that work is, is going in and re because, because you, you, to you, that story that you created is as real as what actually happened, but it's not sure. real. You just made it up. So when you can kind of disentangle those things, it creates this amazing freedom, and then you can make up whatever else you want to make up about yourself because it's all made up at the end of the day. There's no Truly. truth yeah. with a capital T, you know. So, um, so this kind of work, and you know, obviously working on your music, and of course, um, sort of 
the more people you work with, the more people that will hear about you. And, you know, once you get to a point where you're releasing stuff and it's getting played by Armin and, and, um, on the, on any of these guys in whatever genre, um, it's, it sort of, it starts to become, it's like a snowball down a hill, you know, mm-hmm. so it's just, it, the hardest part is really getting that first break. And if it, like was, if it was so life. easy, you know, that I could tell you how to do it in, you know, 30 seconds, then, you know, there, w- <laughs> there wouldn't be a pure mind, you know? <laughs> I guess that's true. What about you there, Ming? I think you know, a lot of what she said is true. I think um, simplifying simplifying things is important. I think everybody, I, one of the things I hate, one of the biggest questions I hate is when people ask me, like what my favorite plugin is and what. Oh, that was my next question. What <laughs> DAW is, you know, like all that kind of like techno techie gear nonsense to me, because the music has nothing to do with that, right? When you were a kid, like I, the fir- I remember taking guitar and playing the drum, the the, the strings with drumsticks, <laughs> and like that's how I, I was banging on it. And I really, really enjoyed <laughs> doing that. It was acoustic guitar, and I was like making my own music. And it wasn't about having to fret anything or whatever. I was just banging on the strings. It's a percussion instrument anyway, but you know, like a dulcimer is like that, right? I didn't know, but I really enjoyed what I was doing. It was simple and it was satisfying to me. And I think that people really forget that music is supposed to be relatively simple in digestion, even if it's complex to make. Here, here. Um, and not every piece of music has to be complex. And the hardest songs to write and the hardest things to make are the things that sound effortless, that seem almost benign. They're the hardest pieces of music that you will ever write in your life. I find writing super complicated, Ming and FS, you know, changing every four bars into this, that, the other thing, simple than writing four chords and a melody and a vocal that's more universal. So I think that perspective and simplicity are really important in your music and to be able to just remember that you're just a person and that you're just a person as you're part of this process and that being a musician and making music is one thing being in the music business is another thing that's something that people need to decide if you want to be making money doing music in the music business you're going to have to make a lot of decisions that have nothing to do with making music um i live in new york city i have a family i have two kids i have a dog you know I have a mortgage, I have stuff, and there's things that I do now that I did not do when I was single and on tour that I had to make, I have to make decisions now that are business decisions that aren't, um, that just are different than the things that I did when I was younger. So that doesn't mean that like I'm making, the money is ruling my music. It just means that you have to understand your position, again, your position, like where are you in life? How much time do you have? How much money do you have? All of these things change. There are, if your dad or mom has money out the wazoo and you do not need to make money, then your then your college is basically like you can make music until someone says the tap is off, <laughs> right? If you're somebody who's starving but has to work eight jobs, to, to and has an hour or two to make music, but makes brilliant music in that hour or two, then make sure that that hour or two are the best hour or two that you can possibly have. And that's how you go from being like, I was a, a, an internet guy. I, I worked at startups and I made a lot of money working at startups and I funded Ming and FS. That's how we were able to maintain, like Fred was in the studio making beats while I was at the at the at at my day job. And then I came home and I'd sleep for an hour and then I'd join him in the studio or I'd work in the studio. And we did that for four years in nonstop day in. I would, I would work 60 hours at my tech job. I would come home and sleep for two hours. I would go work in the studio until I couldn't anymore. Then I would go out to meet everybody at the club so yeah, that I was working at night because he would get up in the morning and start the process. And, and then when we started getting gigs, we'd fly out on a Wednesday. I'd sleep in my, under my desk on Thursday morning. And then I'd fly out on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sleep in under my desk. Monday, I would come straight, straight from the plane. And I did that for four years. That's how it worked for me. I learned how to do press. I learned how to do photographs. I learned how hmm. to do, there was no, there was no social media the way it is now. We had a blog. like. There are things that you learn, things will change, but what doesn't change is being true to you wherever you are at that time and trying to be open to growing because you're always going to grow. And if you stop growing, if you're stuck at like, you know, ah, this, I'm only making this music or I'm only doing that, your career is over before it started. You should just know that because the chances of you being that closed off 
and actually being able to connect with people um, in the industry to to get behind you is to is you know you have to be likable. You don't have to be the nicest person, but you have to be likable. And likable means you're either so talented that people are gravitating towards you because your talent is is what they like, or you're super nice and you're a great writer, or you know, like all these different things. You don't have to be perfect. You're just a person, but you have to be likable. Yeah, the big takeaway from my music business class, I'll just give it away to everybody here on the internet for free, is don't be a dick. <laughs> that's pretty much it, yeah. I mean, that's like, that's I did, it's been 16 weeks to teach the kids that, but like, that, yeah. I mean, underlying, it's, and an, show it's, up. it's a network, right? Yeah. It's, it's about personalities. It's about working with people. You guys have both echoed that throughout this podcast, and it's yeah. so true. It's like, I, be dependable, show up when you're going to say you're going to show up, and then be able to work with other people yeah, otherwise yeah, like why are you yeah. why are you in this thing to be in a silo yeah. of your own little computer and your I, I find one of the i want to touch on two points because we, we talked about it before we started recording but the first point is a lot of people get what we call like the, the business so you start out with working with somebody who's new in the business and you start you like the way that they they do x y and z you start bringing them into more projects bringing them into more projects and then all of a sudden, one day they wake up and like, you're not good enough for them anymore. Like, I don't need you anymore. You don't, you know, like, I don't, I'm not going to do, I, I don't want to sing. You know, like, there's this like thing where somebody thinks that they've made it. They may get a little bit of love somewhere and all of a sudden they think that they've made it. Right. <laughs> and so they don't need you anymore and they burn that bridge. That is a terrible idea. Because A, you haven't made it. You haven't made it until the money is in the bank. Because if you're in the music business, there needs to be money in the bank for it to be business. Otherwise, it's just practice. Hmm. Or it's a hobby. That's the thing people that don't really understand is that your music career is just a hobby until until you receive a paycheck for it. And you may never receive a paycheck for it. So when you're doing your hobby, are you mean to people? Do you tell people that you don't need them anymore? Hmm. Do you tell people that I'm better than you now? Do you tell people that like, you know, like I've learned everything I can learn from you in, when you're doing your hobby? Right? Change the word. Am I a musician or am I a hobby musician? You're a hobby musician if you don't make money period. If you don't pay your bills with making money for music, then, then you are working your way towards being a full-time musician, but it's just a, a hobby. And that's okay. But would you be mean to people when you have a hobby? That's that's what I'm trying to get across. Like, when was the last time people playing pickup baseball were mean to each other? Like, you know, you don't play with that guy anymore, right? Right. <laughs> like, I'm not playing with Billy anymore because he's mean about when I, when I got thrown out of third base, he threw a fit. Like, that's what that's like. Oh, I don't need. I don't need I've baseball. actually played softball with dickheads like that, though. That's really funny that that's the analogy you pull. But it's no, it's, people, point, it's, it's, it's a point well taken. Yeah. It's the, true. the last thing that I wanted to talk about, and Aruna brought this up a little bit earlier, is the difference between men and women in the music business. And I want to touch on this from man, from a man's perspective, um, because it's it's a it's a touchy subject. I don't want to mansplain this this subject, but I want to talk <laughs> about it. And part of why I'm saying that is this. Part of what makes you successful in the music business is having a little bit of, is having the drive to be a little bit of a dick, but right. also pushing your career forward and making yeah. things happen. And you see this in the workforce with like type A personalities, with men being mean to women and not treating women as equals and all that kind of, and it happens. It's, that's a reality. You know, if you take, everybody knows that it happens. If you don't believe that that happens in the workforce, you're just not paying attention to humanity. It's not a good equal situation for men and women in the workplace. But in the music business, it's even worse hmm. because there aren't a lot of mu female music executives and there aren't a lot of female artists and there are, you know, there are a lot of artists, but they're not, they're, there's not a lot of women producers. And it has to do, I think, with the pecking order that we create starting from the bot from the ground up. Women weren't, maybe it's changed now, but women weren't pushed into doing math and science as when, when I was younger, right? And so men feel like they're better at math and science. Well, technology is math and science. So then men are better at like that mentality is prevalent. I think that the pool of people entering the music business from the music, from the, from the female perspective or as a producer is less, there's just less people doing it so that the few that are in there just take a beating. That's just, it's just a, not a normal beating. I mean, it's a beating to be in the music business in the first place. And then it's super misogynistic. And, 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 and it's even in content, like hip hop is super misogynistic. And, you know, dance music is like, again, dance music, there's a lot of male producers who feel like it's a technology thing, therefore they're better at it. 
Um, there are amazing producers. I mean, amazing, like um, um, uh, Imogen, how do you say his name? Um, uh, Imogen Heap. Heap. Yeah, I mean, she is brilliant. Almost every record she makes is brilliant. I'm uh, Every time I listen to her, I'm like, you know, it's just so good. But what she's had to, her, the adversity that she's probably gone through has actually made her better. So the point of this whole circular thing that I'm talking about here is that that actually exists. That, that man against woman thing is worse in the music business. And what I would say to that also is that if you're a female producer, that you take that, that thing that you know is there and you use that to your advantage and you just be better. You just be better than the average male producer. There are so many bad male producers. <laughs> oh, man. No, oh, yeah. serious, like by volume, that's like the thing. Is like if yep. I was to put a room, if I was going to make a producer's camp where I would get to pick the people that were going to be at the camp, I would say because of the sheer volume of, of producers, there's going to be more men than women, but the camp wouldn't be made up of just men. It would be made up of the best people that I know of making music so that I could learn from them and do, do new things. And I think... Um, you know, unfortunately, some men in the music business are are wary of allowing women to be better than them because they want they want to sit. That's like it's like a safe space for men. Hmm. Right. It's like, you know, it's it's like anything in life. You get yep. a, you get a, you somebody who's a great at a sport and they go, oh, but that's women's basketball. Right. Hmm. Well, there's a million women who are better than me at ba- basketball because I am terrible. Yeah, right? maybe and more. I still like to watch them play basketball because they're really good. And I think that that mentality is this weird sort of backwards thing that we have to fight, especially in the studio as well, which is like I've seen it in writing sessions where a woman will come in <clears throat> and there's more than one man in the room <clears throat> and the other writer will not let the woman have any sort of say as to what's going on this record. And you're like, but that's the woman who's going to sing the song. Jeez, we, need, yeah. we need her right? to have an opinion. Yeah. I need to know what she thinks about this lyric. I need her to contribute because that's who's going to do the work. I could care. I really actually could care less about the other person's opinion. I care about her opinion, right? And that's and maybe that's that maybe also. So the point is being sensitive to the people that you're working with and allowing people to be themselves and be creative, and not subscribe to the things that we're trying to get away with away from in, in say real life. You know, real life. The music business and music should allow you to be different and, and unified and try to go by merit and try to reach for something great not worry about social stratification hmm. or if somebody's better than you right because when you work with people who are better than you you get better period it's true it's, it's, it's kind of like sharing the only way that you get better is that you learn things from somebody who's better than you and you'll never know who's better than you if you don't give them a chance to be to be great um all right aruna i know so, you're you're chomping at the bit now all right, no, let him go. That- I, I love it though, Brent. I, yeah. I, yeah. So edit that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Runa, I'd we're, love to hear We're just going to cut all this that. last part off anyway. So don't just say whatever you want. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I do agree with Ming that it is, I mean, I can't say for sure because I've never been a man, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's a lot harder for women. A lot harder like exponentially harder. So any females that want to do this, that are listening, it's like, you know, you have to go into this knowing what you're up against. And, you know, at the same time where I was talking about, you know, your conversations about life and not being cynical, at the same time, you want to, I don't don't like the word realistic, but um, it's good to know what you're walking into so that you don't get creamed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, crushed yeah. inside. You know what I mean? It, and, yeah. and that you don't take it personally because it's not about you. It's it's um. There's just it's it's like he was saying that there's just so few, um, that yeah, the pool of good ones is just going to be a uh, few women. That the pool of really good female producers is so small. I mean, I'm a DJ. I listen to music all the time. I'm always hunting for new um, tracks, new artists. And even as somebody doing that, it's like, like, like you said, Imogen Heap, who's like my number one favorite artist in the world. I wouldn't call her dance, but um, other than her, like I'm, there's some others, but no one that I would put at like the seven lions, Maddie and Porter Robinson level that I've heard. They may be out there, 
And I think a lot of what holds a lot of women back, I don't believe for a second that it has to do with, you know, inferior skills in STEM. No, nah, it's not. Math, science. Um, I think that's absolute bullshit. Um, no, no, no. no. I, is, you should, I, I didn't say that women have inferior skills. I want to make that clear. I think that that's the mentality that men have because of the way that they te- schools are teaching hard sciences. That's, that's definitely a common thing. They definitely... You know, people have this idea that women should be learning a certain set of things, and men should be. When we're, I'm in New York, and you're you're in San Francisco or LA. LA. You believe me? There are many places where this still exists, where there's women's things to learn, and that's what I'm saying. This is crazy. We think it's crazy, but what I'm just saying is that it's it's a way that people treat each other based on these silly notions, yeah, based people. on these yeah. like archetypes that don't necessarily have anything to do with reality. Pretty archaic. But I think <laughs> well, I think you might be right in the sense that. Um, some women might get intimidated, but um, I know, I mean, the valedictorian in my school was a girl and she, she was genius, genius at math. So, I mean, you know, I saw, what was that movie um, with Octavia Spencer, the NASA women? I mean, gene, hidden figures, like amazing. So, the awesome so the skills are there i think really what the issue is it's it's a mindset and it's this kind of there are so few role models that are like demonstrating what's possible for women as artists and um this is again one of the reasons to circle back to what i originally started the the session with um that i started mentoring is because i would love to find women who have it have music in their heart have music in their bones that you know think they feel like they have a voice but they're a little bit maybe they don't have i mean when i was young i had mentors um and that helped me so much and you know sometimes i mean fuck it's it's hard out there life is brutal it's like you know ming was saying even when you're you're you know have a lot of um, accolades behind you, you still get rejected all the time. So to keep pushing forward through that, it takes something in here. It takes a strength. It takes a confidence. And, and I feel like the more women are doing it, the more that confidence will, will be there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the other thing I want to say too, is that women need to honor their, not just their voice, but their way of, and this is, this is something that I've, very recently sort of come into and and it was a big aha moment and I'm not going to take credit for this. This was Elizabeth Gilbert who said this is brilliant. So she said there's two types of people. There's jackhammers and there's hummingbirds, right? So jackhammers are like people who just bore into an idea and they're like a pit bull with the jaws just like and they just go at it incessantly like like horse with blinders on. And, you know, I think as a producer, it's such a hard thing to learn that there definitely needs to be a period of this. Um, and I think just because of the differences between men and women, men tend to be a little bit more single minded. And um, it's maybe easier for men to go into that jackhammer type of um, mindset. But hummingbirds... Are different hummingbirds have this cre- this curiosity right and so they sort of they go over here and they go over there and they go and they kind of go around and they're not so obsessively focused with one thing but the gift of the hummingbird is that it it sort of brings this into that and then it brings this into that and there's all this like as she says aerating and cross-pollinating going on and it's just sort of breathes new life into the entire scene into the entire conversation and I think that is the thing that that women who are I think naturally a little bit more um have different interests in all kinds of things like um more I won't say more emotional but just I feel like the 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 gift that one of the gifts that women will bring to this conversation once there are more of us it having the conversation is this kind of cross-pollinating of other ideas and um art forms into music and um, making it a richer place because of it. Yeah, so, it's inevitable, um, right? I feel like it's time. It, the The circumstances socially are right. It's almost like, uh, reminds me of when Lilith, the Lilith era 20 years ago. Right. Um, I feel like we're right. sort of back to, you know, to that, to, you know, the Women's March was just 
was epic. And I think we're going to see more things like that as this sort of patriarchy in the government gets um, Rattled. intensifies and and uh, I'm seeing this surge, you know, uh, Van Jones called Trump's win the white lash. And what I see as this resistance movement, I, I'm calling it the light lash, is this sort of like rising up of love and unity against hmm. all, all these other um, kind of hmm. dark qualities. And I would love to see that reflected in the music. And I think it's happening and it will continue to happen. Let the power speak, or let the people speak. They have power. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, kind of Maybe hard. edit that part out, huh? Do you, do you participate in any of this? <laughs> Did you say something about white power? That's messed up, man. <laughs> I'm not recording anymore, but I was going to say, you may want to no, just we, mention if, we, well, um, we are. like, meetups. Because in, in, out here on the, on the East Coast, there's there's been a lot of sort of um, female beat makers meetups and that kind of thing happening. And... Um, you know, when, when I first heard of that, I just was like, oh, that's so silly. We're, we're delineating now between men and women. And then I, then the more I was getting involved in, you know, being around those, I was like, yeah, it's nice to be in a, an environment that I don't want to call it a safe space, but a space that's just different. It's accessible. It yeah. doesn't have to deal. Well, you know, some have to deal with men. Like, let, well, you know what? Doesn't We already know what men think in this. Seriously, though. <laughs> we already know what men are going to add to that. Sure. Right. So wouldn't it be nice to have a space that's sort of like, again, in music, you have separate teams. You don't have separate teams because... Because there are different things that men and women do. And physically, there's a difference between a lot of men and women. It's not a general thing. But, you know, so that's why you have separate teams, so that you don't have big, huge men beating on women who are, might actually be great at a sport. But we don't know because the men would dominate if we don't allow people to have their own right areas yeah, It's like weight play. classes in boxing, right? Like, that's kind of exactly what, what you're getting at. So that's the you know, we just, we just with, did a with, producer with, meetup here two days ago uh, on Sunday with a with Mixathon, Mixathon 48, which is like a nonprofit in Berkeley. And they approached us. And A, it was really cool because they're an Asian-centric um, community. And so we saw way more Asian producers coming into this than we normally would see at our events, which was fantastic because they're supporting their own community. And we saw a good chunk of female producers. I think I want to say four out of a room of 30. Which it's not a ton, but look, it's better than one. Yeah, right. It's ahead of the average. Was a long time ago. It, it, yeah. Exactly, and and so yeah. it was, you know we're going to start doing more in that space instead of like kind of this lecture based event um, where it's really more about the community interacting here in our space. And uh, so Ming, I'm glad you brought it up, man, because it, it is it's nice to. Um, uh, to, to provide that safe space. I know Aaron Barra, who is a, a teacher at Berkeley and has yeah. done a lot of stuff here with us. And we, uh, we love Aaron. Um, she's been a podcast guest for us as well. She's very invested in this like female producer community and, and, and creating uh, organizations um, around that. And so it's good to see this upswelling of a female movement. I know that a lot of our more popular mentors are, you know, like Stoney is one of our, our biggest mentors to, to, to date. And she's a rock star, right? She's amazing right. at what she does. Um, and so, yeah, I, we've always just tried to encourage diversity in all forms, you know, here, even back when, when Greg and I first started doing test press, which were like these American Idol sort of style events where kids could get feedback on their productions. We'd have a panelist of three people and we would always try and have at least one woman or one person of color, ideally both out of the three. And man, after you've cycled through San Francisco once, it's hard to like keep that level of diversity up because there's just too many white dudes doing this stupid thing called dance music right, <laughs> right. And sometimes you're like yeah. dude uh, enough already with the shaved head white guy right like <laughs> yeah. so right aaron so we've anyways, got two of them here right now I know, right so <laughs> no but seriously thank thank you guys so much for your time um uh and i love that we kind of took a left here at the end and really explored some new you know some ground so aaron nice work on bringing that up um Aruna, it's great to have you in the network. Um, uh, Ming, it was great you. to have you for the remix contest and just as a, as a dear friend all these years. So thanks for hanging out, buddy. Uh, uh, again, Chris Gear, myself here at Pure Mind, thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you guys ever want to get a hold of us, you can hit us at producingoutloud at puremind.com. Please, please, please comment here in the YouTube videos. Um, we love reading through them. Hopefully you guys get a chance to, to check out the comments and, and toss in some answers. There's always questions, um, especially as an inflammatory as uh, women in music, right? We're going to have opinions, which is a good thing. So, so. Um, yeah, good stuff, you guys. Thanks so much. So uh, without any further ado, I think we're going to sign off. But thanks again for being here. We'll catch you guys later. We'll, See you again we'll, soon. And, and we'll link to all their socials and everything so you guys can make sure that you're... Good meeting you, Aruna. It was really nice uh, talking with you. You yeah. too. Cheers. All right, guys. Bye. Later. Peace. Take care. 
If you're a music producer, subscribe to our channel and stay up to date on the latest PureMind tutorial videos, track breakdowns, elite sessions, and more. Visit us at PureMind.com. Thank <laughs> you.